it's uh, I, that's a good it was more maturity now I I have I would say more sympathy for him but perhaps with better understanding of a part of some of the reasons why he why he was so rigid yeah although you know when he passed away his his daughter said you know like something in the newspaper just quoted saying but my father was so vilified for opposing the equal rights movement that he really didn't oppose it. Oppose uh -huh. equality for women, they just didn't understand him. Mm -hmm. uh, like the women that. didn't understand him? Yeah, right. We, oh, didn't, oh, we didn't understand him. Oh, excuse oh, me. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, right. Now, we understood the politics of it well, well enough, that's mm -hmm. for sure. But we, we blocked him from becoming a judge, and that was, was quite a quite another little That was something we had no idea doing. Remember how we grinned like hell when we accomplished that? Last all day. And How do you, you know, stop someone becoming a judge? Do you, do you want to know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do all of it? Uh, you know, you don't. So, all right, so Jean Craw, I'm out in Arizona working at the ERA. Jean had taken the job as a force of director at now. Jean calls me up and she says, oh. <laughs> and I knew this was a preface for something really bad. And she said, they're going to make Jim Thompson. Our judge in Alexandria, and for the judgeship that he was going to be appointed to, it would have meant that all divorce cases, custody cases, you know, all of the court judges, the court court judge yeah. would have come, for the women in Alexandria would have come before it. And this was just like, probably, it was just not, not acceptable. It was just chilling to think that's what it could happen. So I said, well, we have to stop it. She said, well, I don't know how we're going to stop it. So we come up with this elaborate strategy. Uh, first of all, Dick Hobson, incumbent Democrat, appoints a blue ribbon panel to uh, look at various uh, judicial candidates. Mm -hmm. And the judicial candidates were Jim Thompson and Al Grenadier. And I looked at that, oh my gosh, Thompson's got to have his crowd come out. Grenadier was like this old man, 50. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, he's going to have this crowd. I got to have. I would, but there were a lot of young judges and uh, young attorneys in Alexandria that were members of the Alexandria bar, and therefore they'd be entitled to vote. So I went to my lawyer, Terry Sidley, who was a young lawyer. I said, Terry, you've got to run for judge. You, you've got to run for judge. We will work desperately hard to get all the young lawyers to come to the bar. This was because there was going to be a meeting. With Association would endorse one of the candidates. Right. Or really, really hard to get everybody to come to that. And then um, on the first ballot, nobody will get a majority. And then you will pull out and throw your support to Al Grenadier. Once we have all these young lawyers in the room and they won't vote for Trump, and that's what happened. So he doesn't get the bar endorsement. But Blue, Dick Hobson's Blue Ribbon panel is about to give them him the endorsement because that's the way Hobson had set it up to cover himself. And I called him up and I said, Dick, you, you know, the bar is going to, I knew this was going to, the bar is going to vote to endorse Grenadier and you're going to be hung with your, your little special panel. And he said, I don't know what to do. He said, I figured out a voting, a preferential voting system for his panel and one of the uh, African American women uh, that I knew was on this panel and she got them to adopt the pre preferential voting system. So that meant that his Hobson special little you know, endorsement to endorse Grenadier also. I don't think Grenadier understood that we made him a judge. Anyway, but still, it doesn't matter because the way judges are selected is that the Democratic caucus, which controlled uh, both the House and the Senate back in those days, back in those <laughs> days, uh, most of them have now be become Republicans. Which just they just, anyway, they, they, they be behind closed doors and they decide who the judges are going to be, and then all the Democrats have to vote that way. So, the chair of the caucus was Matt Hardaway Marks, and Jim Thompson's campaign manager was this man John Gray from Delegate from Hampton. And we, of course, are, have people, women all over the state, you know, calling their delegates, doing you know, the grassroots campaign as much pressure as possible, and, they, and Hardaway doesn't call the caucus meeting doesn't call the caucus meeting, doesn't call the caucus meeting, which meant we, we knew they didn't have the vote yet. And then, and we, but we didn't either. But then, then we thought we did. We thought, by, by golly, we're going to beat him. And, and then Hardaway called the caucus. 
bad sign because Hardaway would not have called the caucus unless he thought he had the votes, which meant that we thought we had the votes, they thought they had the votes. Democrats were lying. Now, big shock there. So some some people, some delegates were, were telling you know, uh, Hardaway or John Gray that they would vote for Thompson, and then some were telling same, some of the same ones were telling us they vote for Grenadier. So the, we had to find out who were the troopers. Who are the troopers? Who are the people who are going to go sideline? So the only way to find out is Thompson's campaign manager, John Gray, who tended to drink a little more perhaps than he should have. And with the help from me, uh, he got really drunk that night. <laughs> you're, you're so helpful. <laughs> and then with more help from me, I, you know, I said, we're going to win tomorrow. You know, we, we are going to win. Oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. Okay, no, no. I, I said, well, you have to prove it to me. I'm not going to believe it. I poured my drink, by the way, into the potted plant. <laughs> you, 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 you have got to, I said, I'll, I'll show you my list if you'll show me yours. <laughs> and so he fell, all right, I'm going to show you. He pulls out this. I mean, he's drunk. He pulls out his list, and, there, and so I quickly take note of everybody that's on, on his list. I know who the people are. There were about five of them that had told us they were going to vote for Grenadier, that had told him they were going to vote for Thompson. So we then went to, well, I never showed him our list, of course. <laughs> 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 so, we really find out. <laughs> so, so the next, next it's late at night in the Holiday Inn that we finally get this information. So the next day, they were going to have the have the session first and then have the caucus afterwards. So we recruited uh, members who were really solidly on our side to leave the floor of the house and walk into the caucus room with the people who were going to be turncoats and demand to witness their ballots. Because they were secret ballots, but colleagues could ask to see their ballot. And so we double teamed every single one of who had, had said that they were lying to both sides, and we got all their votes because our people demanded to see their ballots before they handed them in. And, and, and we we're able to say, you said you were a Grenadier vote, now let's see it. And so under that kind of peer pressure, and of course John Gray didn't, didn't, he, he, he didn't have that same kind of apparatus. He, he was not, uh, I mean, he, he just didn't know what he was up against. Uh, anyway, so, so uh, Grenadier got the caucus in Berkeley and Johnson, um, John Johnson was blocked from being a judge. However, he did go on the Security and Exchange Commission because they were going to reward their own, but people do it nearly as much damage from that uh, from that position yes, as they yes, yes. judge in Alexandria. I don't um, remember that was that was when he didn't get the appointment. It was, it was a fabulous day. Oh, it was wonderful. Oh, it, it was, to me, that is probably the most intricate thing I ever did politically, pulling off all those, so figuring out how that worked and pulling off all those, those different pieces, including getting John Gray so drunk that he pulled out the list right up. <laughs> <laughs> whatever works. Absolutely. Yes, whatever works. <laughs> and you cannot say you were not imaginative. <laughs> That's true. We were very imaginative. <laughs> I so trust John we had our own <laughs> Oh, he paid for his drinks and my drinks. Excellent. <laughs> That's even better. That makes it perfect. As a matter of fact, you know, there, uh, when, when Pat did the ERA Times and it had the, the dirty dozen, mm -hmm. the bullseye thing, he had that hanging on his um, on the wall of his office. He was so proud of it. And I stole it and replaced it with feminist. <laughs> I still have it. I still have it. Fortunately, I mean, some of these people didn't go on a very good end. Unfortunately, John Gray was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer and he shot himself. So, mm -hmm. so. anyway, it, um, it, one of the things I learned in, in, all, in this, and I, 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 I really liked Jim Thompson. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I had, was a Democrat in Alexandria. I had worked with him for years. I, we, did, we did that rally. You know, the, the week, uh, weekend before the election. And it really was a setup for him. And it wasn't for Gary Myers. Or it didn't have to be for Gary Myers. Gary, you know, 
and I, I said to Thompson, this is your rally. You can make this your rally. I'd rather, much rather have the, the uh, majority leader on our side right, <laughs> than some right. old junior, nothing, you know, <laughs> Republican at that time. And they said, all you have to do, all you have to do is come and say, there are times when an elected representative uh, feels he must vote his conscience. There are other times when an elected representative realizes he must vote the conscience of the people he represents. And this is one of those times, even though I personally do not support this amendment, I recognize and honor my constituents. There's no other thing they can do. I said, that's all you have to do. You will win. You will save your seat. <laughs> oh, no, he says, I can't do that. And this little campaign manager, Mike Baker, there says, Marion, if I can't or I'll organize a bunch of women, I'll leave town. <laughs> Did he? I don't know. I don't know what he would do. <laughs> anyway, but he wouldn't do it. I mean, it was there for him on the silver platter to save him himself. So, and he wouldn't do it. And so he went down. Went down. What, if I'm correct, um, in looking in working on this uh, for the book I'm hoping to finish writing, we defeated him by about 2,000 votes or 2,200 votes, which was approximately the number of signatures on the pro ERA petition that we delivered to him that he wouldn't receive. He wouldn't receive those petitions in '76, and it was approximately that same number. Yes. Yes. And we beat him in his home precinct. Mm -hmm. yeah. But not your home precinct. Because we couldn't do that to you. That's right. Fine. And, and this was, of course, part of the books by I, too, which is I was a member of the Democratic Committee, had been for uh, 70 years at that point. I was treasurer. Uh, I went to the point when Gary Myers was, when Vera decided to support Gary Myers, I resigned as president of Vera. I went to the leader, uh, my fellow executive committee members on the Democratic Committee, and said, here's what's going to happen. This is, we're going to have this campaign. I'm not going to have anything to do with this. I'm going to be working elsewhere in the state. And I didn't. We never saw any of that headquarters. <laughs> I mean, working elsewhere in the state, I was ex exclusively for Democrats. But I really think I should resign as treasurer because we don't need that kind of high profile. I said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that, Mary Ann. You can't do that. You can't be treasurer. So I didn't resign. I should have. And, and I abided by my word. There was one time when Charlie called me for serious advice that I had to give. And one time when Susan dropped by in the middle of the night. But other than that, I kept out of that. that and the people in Alexander ran, ran that. Oh, yeah. Lonnie Rich, who went on to become a big Democrat. He was at Jane's thing today. He was at Jane's thing today. You know, he, he said, I never met Mary Ann Fowler. I was there almost every night, and I never met Mary Ann Fowler until after the election. But what happened was election night, of course. I rushed to the <laughs> headquarters on, on Washington Street, Washington which I passed by today, by the way, and I to take pictures that I didn't have to stop. And it was so exciting because the results were coming in. It was clear we were winning. We were winning. And then the Washington Post called, and Susan took the call first, Susan Aiken, and she was just blithering. She was just simply blithering. She couldn't even exchange, explain what was going on. So Tori took this with Tori Armstrong, Charles E. Tyler, took the phone away from Susan, gave it to Charles and, and, and Charles e, she couldn't even blither. <laughs> she, she was just so excited that she was just speechless. And so Tor Tori said to me, says Marion, you've got to talk to the post because if you don't, we're gonna lose the story that it was women who defeated Jim Thompson. It was ERA and the women's organizing. Why women. couldn't you one time be Mrs. Barrett? I don't know. <laughs> so I got on the on the phone. Could have been Charles e. Armstrong. They didn't see who it was. I, I you know, stealing uh, cards was one thing. Lying about your name was another. I guess I don't know. But uh, but I told the the reporter. I said this was. I want to make this clear. This wasn't me. This was. I gave this Charles e. Armstrong suit. Blah blah. And it was not me. I did not. This, this is. Not my campaign over here. I'm simply <coughs> asked to be a spokesperson with these people. But he printed it in terms of the first person. But the Democratic Committee knew what was going on. They 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 knew. They were just so enraged. But it was this, and this is the thing that probably hurt me the most during, during that. It was the women who were more enraged than the men. I'm sorry. It was
was the women who were more enraged than the men. It was the women who were patriotic. Right. Women who had actually worked, yeah. and I knew they had worked because I've been told that women who had actually worked in their precincts for the Gary, Meyer, Gary Myers and Dick Hobson, who were on the committee and sat there and, because of, out of fear, voted to purge me. And there were other women, Lois Hunt particularly, did I remember her? Yes, of course. Of course. Uh, just awful. Of course, that, and I'm told, you know, like six months later, but Mary and Lo Lois, or a year later, said Lois was an abused wife, so we have to forgive her. Uh, but she, for years, she told people that I had embezzled. And I, I said, no, 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 that I had embezzled <coughs> as treasurer of the Democratic Committee. I had embezzled the money for the ERA campaign to defeat Jim Thompson out of the Democratic Treasury. That's where the money had come from. And what a good idea. Yeah. Well, well I, I always thought it was, a, it really was a, a comment on my integrity with which I was held that I didn't embezzle money for me. I embezzled it for the campaign. But I, I ran into that a good 10 years after that election when I went to my polls to vote Ms. Twoman Barbara Bergman. I said, oh, you're very amusing. I embezzled all the money. And I called up Lois, I said, Lois, this is the last time. If I ever hear that again, ever, ever, ever hear that again, I will sue you until for everything you have. I don't care if you're abused one or not, I will sue you. I'm tired of this. And, and truly, I made the decision not to move out of Alexandria. There were people who urged me to move into Arlington, and I didn't do it. Uh, and yet, I, I have no real relationship with that community. I mean, I've lived in the kind of ostracized state all of these years. Well, wasn't there something about the Democratic Committee in Alexandria not doing something or other that caused them to get bad seats at the state convention? Oh, well, no, I sued. I sued them. Okay. When they purged me from the committee, I sued them. This was all part of this unfolding. <coughs> and this was, this was where National Now was really very helpful. National Now was very helpful in this right in the immediate aftermath of, of the um, defeat of Thompson and the arrest. And so they had their lawyers be the lawyers on the case. So I sued the Democratic part, Committee in the 8th District and the state, the whole, all of them. And we already the chain. Right, all the chain for restoration of my position. And it was a very good legal argument. I mean, we had very good lawyers. And it went all the way up to the level of the short of the Supreme Court. Warren Lewis, I guess, was the judge. He had shock of white hair, and he said, isn't this really all about the Equal Rights Amendment? And the Democratic Party's lawyer, who was Jerry Malouse, by the way, said, no, Your Honor, it's not. And he said, what do you mean it's not? Of course it is. You didn't like the fact that the lady beat that Jim Thompson in Alexandria. That's what this is all about. But anyway, uh, it, uh, because Jerry Malouse charged a bunch of money, <laughs> and, and they divided up the city of Alexandria, 8th District, the state were all supposed to pay part of it. But the 8th District, which included Alexandria, they didn't come up with their money in a timely fashion, like years and years and years. And so as a punishment to them, the state party would seat them in the very worst seats <laughs> for every every Democratic convention that was held. They would be on the balcony or the basement or someplace like that. So, so, the, so the animosity continue, it continues to I run into people that, although a lot of them are, a lot of them have moved away or died. Now, but I mean, it was, it was so intense. Years. What? It's been over 30, 30 years. years. Oh, yeah. But I, I swear to God, it was the most exciting thing that ever happened in Alexandria politics. Or something. <laughs> I don't know what, why it uh, carried such salience to it. Uh, although I have certain, I have theories. I do have theories about it. why it was the women who were the most vehement. And, and I think it had to do with the fact that this committee was very, very much controlled by men. Uh, and I, even though this was a fairly liberal community, as we demonstrated, uh, when I was first elected to it, I, they wouldn't call on me. I mean, I would raise my hand. Oh, when I was first elected, you had to stand up and introduce yourself. And I did, and, all, and I got all 